G'day, Chris here and welcome back to Clickspring. When it comes to creating detailed shapes in metal, it's often hard to beat traditional sand casting. It's generally the least expensive casting process, has good versatility when it comes to materials, shapes and sizes, and all things considered is well suited to the home shop. But eventually a part or project comes along that simply doesn't suit that process. It might have geometry that isn't convenient to make into a split pattern. Or it might require the capture of superfine detail beyond what sand casting can generally provide. And this is where the lost wax process can provide a solution. The example I've chosen as the test piece for this video is a Roman oil lamp based on those held in the British Museum collection. And whether today or 2000 years ago, it's a great candidate for lost wax casting. The original lamps have a complex flowing geometry that folds in upon itself in several areas. The body is mostly hollow with thin walls and it has quite small openings for the base, wick and oil filler. For this casting test, I've included some relatively demanding fine detail with a sculptured feature purchased online and then combined with the body of the lamp in Blender. Now lost wax and investment casting are massive subjects and there are several quite distinct parts to it all, depending on which branch of the art we're talking about. Each requires the forming of models, sprueing, surrounding the model with investment or slurry to form a mould, de-waxing of that mould, heating and pouring the metal, and then some amount of finishing work. And I'll visit each of these topics in future videos. But there's a tool at the centre of the investment casting branch of all of this that gives me an opportunity to kick things off with a sort of overview to begin with and that's this vacuum casting machine. I've been using this setup for the last year or so. It's not overly expensive, is easy enough to put together with parts available online and performs well. Starting with the pressure chamber, the unit that I purchased arrived with the fittings on the lid and you can see that I've removed them and let them into the side, making them integral to the stainless steel body. And as it happens, they now ship like this at purchase, so that'll save you some time and a couple of holes in the lid. Now a blowout isn't necessarily something that we're expecting in normal operation, but there's always a chance. So much like the commercial machines, I've put a mesh cap over the opening to protect the pump from drawing in anything that might do it harm. The vacuum pump is fairly generic and probably the most expensive part of the whole setup. I've found a 6 CFM unit to be quite adequate, but if the budget permits then going slightly higher capacity certainly won't hurt. Now strictly speaking, what I'm showing in this video would more accurately be described as lost resin casting, since I'm using a resin printed model. Printed models tend to expand before they start to burn out, and so cracking of the mould is a major consideration, particularly as the model gets larger. The Prestige Optima investment from Certus is worth pointing out as being specifically designed for resin and plastic models. In the testing that I've done with several other investments, this stuff clearly outperformed. Not only minimising the tendency to crack, but also in the capture of fine detail and even in the mixing and pouring stages. OK, next up are the flasks, gaskets and sprue bases. These are standard off-the-shelf items at most jeweler suppliers, and you'll select the size according to the scale and shape of the work that you intend to do. Now the way these flasks work with the commercial machines is by dropping them into an adapter plate with a gasket seal that positions them over a vacuum source. And if we're looking at the units aimed at the medium sized studio or shop, they tend to have a maximum flask size of around 5 inch diameter and about 7 inches height. But our chamber is capable of accommodating a much larger volume, well in excess of the largest currently available flask size of 6 by 10 inches. So this is an opportunity to extend the capacity of this shop built system beyond those commercial options. All we need to do to have our system run the entire range of available flasks is to machine up a set of adapter plates for each flask diameter. In my case from half inch aluminium plate. Ok so to recap here's all of the bits and pieces again. Now the adapter plates work pretty much the same as for the commercial machines. This largest plate accommodates the 6 inch diameter flasks and also acts as the main base plate for all of the other plates. 
Every other flask sits on top of this plate, with the appropriate adapter plate and gaskets in between. Once the flask full of investment is taken from the kiln prior to the pour and dropped into the adapter, the weight ensures a good starting seal. And then the vacuum pull just makes that seal stronger as the vacuum builds. Once the pour is complete, the vacuum is broken by opening the inflow valve. And then the flask is retrieved for the quench. Now of course, for the investment part of the process, we get the payoff for having spent the time and effort on making those adapter plates and building around a common chamber. Because the investment mix can be vacuumed in the same space, just using the original Perspex lid that came with the chamber. The chamber will easily accommodate the large mixing bowl required to invest the largest flask and it drops right into the chamber without issue. The pump then draws a vacuum and does exactly what it's supposed to do. And that's basically it. So let's give it a run. The model for this pour has been invested, de-waxed and is now ready to go in the kiln. And the metal, in this case brass, has been brought to pouring temperature. Once the button of metal visible at the top of the flask has lost all colour, the pump goes off and the vacuum is broken. There's some light flashing in parts of the casting surface related to the cracking tendency that I mentioned previously. But overall, the surface finish is okay. So it's on to the next stage of taking off the gate system and generally fettling the casting into a presentable state. Now there's one detail that will often indicate a problem with the quality of a casting. And that's the condition of the gate cross section once we've cut them off with solid metal mostly free of inclusions and porosity being what we prefer to see. Seeing solid metal doesn't necessarily guarantee that all is well inside, but inclusions or porosity in more than a few of the gates is something that would generally lead me to reject a casting and then go looking for the cause. The flashing on these curved surfaces is best dealt with using a set of riffler files.
the hollow section of course is a little more difficult to get to but a quick sandblast sorts it out taking care to avoid all other surfaces for now. And with all of the preparation complete, the base can be soldered into position. This is Tix soft solder with a zinc chloride flux. And finally, some work with the abrasive wheel. To bring up the contrast and polish in a few of the surfaces and taking care to retain the character in that face. Now something that I noticed on the original museum pieces is that they have a slight backslope to the top surface to make sure that any overflow makes its way back into the oil reservoir. Also it's interesting to see that the lamp has such a low centre of gravity, giving it decent stability and a tendency to right itself if bumped. So I do hope that you've enjoyed this opener on the subject of investment casting. It's such a fun and useful process and will form a central part of many of the future projects. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.